when you look at the oceans, they seem so vast that you think to yourself, how could people possibly fish out the ocean? Most of the ocean is biologically a desert. The life is there, but it's very, very sparse. Ninety percent of the big fish in the world's oceans are gone. All this in 50 years, in my lifetime. We have had more impact on the wildlife in the sea than during all preceding human history. Wild salmon are sacred to my community. My parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents. All of them depended on salmon for their health and their survival. My own family is no different. We count on these salmon. As the demand for seafood increases, along with the fishing power of the global fleet, the question becomes, can the oceans keep up with the hunt? Many of the fish species we depend on are in serious trouble as we enter the 21st century, and the situation is becoming more critical every day. As fish populations closer to home are depleted, seafood is being flown into wholesale markets from remote locations halfway around the world, where fish, for the time being, can still be caught. But even in the most remote locations and in the deep waters of the open ocean, fish populations are being exhausted, one after another, by vessels using space-age tracking technology dragging nets that sweep vast areas of ocean floor and deploying miles and miles of baited hooks. When I started fishing, there were a lot of fish. I think that the greatest difficulty has certainly been when you know what you know about fishing and you know you've got the information and you're doing the right thing and you go out and there's still nothing there. It's not here anymore. It's, it's, it's all gone. It's just unbelievably sorts you should catch. And right, right close, you know, but sense, you didn't have to go very far to get them. Simply put, the fish cannot reproduce quickly enough to keep up with an ever-intensifying hunt, feeding an ever-growing human population. Many of the collapses that we've seen, many of the new changes that are happening in oceans are a consequence of activities that people have always engaged in. It's just at a much greater rate and a faster scale. Illegal fishing is also contributing to the decline of fish populations. Species like Patagonian toothfish, marketed as Chilean sea bass, are being fished into commercial extinction by pirate fishermen. Because international treaties are hard to enforce on the open ocean, pirate vessels illegally catch immense volumes of fish that find their way into wholesale markets around the world. Despite the intensified effort, there is evidence that the global catch has been decreasing since the 1980s, a decline that many scientists believe would be more apparent were it not for the capture of species considered unmarketable a decade ago. As larger fish disappear, the global fleet is targeting smaller fish at the lower rungs of the marine food chain. Because these species are the prey of larger fish and other marine life, their wholesale removal may cause even further collapses. Also contributing to overall declines is the unintended capture of fish and other species which never even reach the marketplace. 
Each year, over 20 million metric tons of untargeted marine life, so-called bycatch, are discarded as waste, a volume equal to four times the entire catch of the U.S. fishing fleet. The amount of bycatch differs with each type of fishery, but among the worst are shrimp trawls. U.S. shrimpers are working hard to reduce this waste, but worldwide, on average, over five pounds of untargeted marine life are discarded for each pound of shrimp caught. Many scientists now believe that the fishing gear commonly used to catch shrimp and bottom fish like cod and haddock can cause long-term damage to sensitive marine ecosystems as the nets are dragged along the sea floor, trapping everything in their path. Of equal concern is the world's vast fleet of longliner vessels that can each deploy up to 60 miles of baited hooks, snagging endangered sea turtles, sharks, juvenile fish, and other untargeted marine life. Although fishermen try to limit the bycatch, attempts at making this gear more selective have had limited success. Fortunately, not all fishing methods and gear pose a threat to the ocean's bounty. Some New England fishermen are now catching cod the way it was done before the advent of trawling, by simply using hook and line. A hook fisherman uses a baited hook to catch a single fish and leaves the habitat from which that fish came completely intact, ensuring a place for other fish to grow up instead of plowing it over and then saying, whoa, where's all the fish? Well, hey man, you wrecked their home, they've moved on, if, if they're still around. As we enter the 21st century, the international fleet is estimated to have more than twice the capacity needed to fish the oceans in a manner that can be sustained. Fish stocks are in such bad shape in so many cases that We've got to stop fishing those fish to have any hope of bringing them back. And that, of course, raises the question of, well, what are we going to do? Seafood is now increasingly being raised in captivity, a practice known as aquaculture. Over one third of all fish consumed in the United States is farm raised. However, some of the more popular and profitable farmed species, such as salmon and bluefin tuna, pose additional threats to ocean fisheries. They're not vegetarians. They have to be fed other fish. So instead of taking pressure off the ocean, it creates a different kind of pressure to feed and keep fueling the aquaculture. About 17 pounds of fish are required for each pound of weight gain in bluefin tuna and at least three pounds of wild fish must be caught and converted into feed pellets for every pound of salmon raised. Why are we trying to raise carnivores? Taking huge quantities of wildlife from the ocean to turn these creatures into fish meal for farmed raised creatures. We don't know what we're doing. We're monkeying around with our life support system. Not only are there concerns over the amount of feed required, a recent study indicates some feeds may pose a risk to human health. We have sufficiently contaminated our oceans that now if we concentrate the fish meal and fish oil from trash fish that nobody wants to eat, then shove it to fish in a cage and push their weight gain, we can develop animals that are dangerous to eat. An exhaustive study completed by a team of toxicologists has shown that samples of farmed salmon from supermarkets across the U.S. have 10 times more residues of PCBs and dioxins than wild salmon. Dioxin is rated by every national and international agency as a proven human carcinogen. PCBs are rated as probable human carcinogens. I think the most dangerous thing is that exposure to these compounds before birth causes a reduction in IQ of the child. One reason why wild salmon have fewer toxins than farmed fish is because of their natural diet. 
The fish that they eat are lower on the food chain. They have fewer contaminants. And they eat crustaceans. And in fact, the crustaceans, the shrimp, is where the wild salmon get their, their natural pink or red color. And this is unlike the situation with the farm salmon, where the color is an added dye. Scientists are also concerned about the overuse of chemicals and antibiotics in fish farming operations. About a third of all shrimp consumed worldwide is raised in ponds like this, where threats of bacterial infection and disease are often treated by adding chemicals to the water and mixing antibiotics in the feed, a practice some feel can create disease-resistant bacteria that pose yet another serious threat to human health. Additional problems with open ocean net cage operations, like those that raise salmon and tuna, is that seawater flows freely through the pens, untreated, and into the surrounding environment. Local biologists and fishermen say that wild salmon are being infested by lice as they migrate near salmon farms, a problem which can be especially lethal to juvenile fish. Our young fish going out to sea have to pass through this. It kills. And that's the bottom line. And it's happening out there, the floating hotels out there, where there's stress, where there's overcrowding. And when they become overcrowded and stressed, then you have a problem. If you stand on a football field with a person with a cold, you're less likely to get that cold than if you stand in an elevator for four hours with 10 other people who are very sick with the same cold. That's the principle. The transmission potential to the wild fish is huge. Where salmon farms have been located in areas with insufficient tidal flow, the large volume of waste has polluted the sea floor, impacting shellfish and other marine life. Another concern is that due to storms or human error, large numbers of farmed salmon have escaped into the wild. No one knows what the large escapement of farmed salmon could do to our rivers, to our salmon. No one knows that. You know, it's all, it's all to me, everything's all guesswork. In many tropical areas, a way of life and the ecosystem supporting it have been displaced by thousands of shrimp ponds that operate in or near mangrove wetlands. Mangrove forest, it's like the supermarket of people like us to collect crabs or some other kind of herb for medicine. Their life totally depend on the forest. One of the great premises of aquaculture is to provide food for the people who need it the most. But this kind of aquaculture is doing exactly the opposite. It's destroying the habitats that were feeding the people who needed food the most. The immense volume of salt water released from the ponds, often carrying bacteria, viruses, and the chemicals used to control them, has contaminated freshwater aquifers that people depend on. Some shrimp growers are working to improve their operations. They've improved water quality by restoring nearby mangroves and by building settlement ponds for treating wastewater. Some are stocking ponds with lower densities of shrimp to reduce the need for antibiotics. Some salmon growers have also taken first steps toward addressing problems that have plagued their industry. Vaccines now being used have eliminated the need for some antibiotics. Stronger nets and anchoring systems have helped reduce escapements. And experiments with land-based tanks are designed to protect marine environments from farm waste and disease. But for most of the shrimp farming industry, and for most net cage operations raising carnivorous species like salmon and tuna, 
critics believe that fundamental problems remain, some of which may never be solved. Fortunately, not all fish eat fish. Tilapia, one of the most widely farmed freshwater fish in the world, is an omnivore. They can be raised almost entirely on plant-based proteins. Catfish is another aquaculture success story involving an omnivorous fish. When I first started to work, catfish feed contained 12 to 14% fish meal. And today, that feed is about 1 or 2% fish meal. And this has resulted from research. Shellfish are also being farmed in an ever-increasing volume from the Pacific Northwest to the Mediterranean coast of France. This type of aquaculture is becoming an economic mainstay in communities that have been hurt by declining fisheries. These are animals that stay quiet, they stay where you put them, and they clean up the water. You can produce absolutely enormous amount of food in a very small area. Shellfish, in fact, have the potential of feeding humanity. Many consumers remain uncertain of where their seafood comes from, about how it was caught, or whether it was farm-raised. Any idea where your fish came from? Whether it was wild or farm? I have no idea. I don't know. It looks good, though. I have no clue. I'm just eating it. Knowledge about food safety and whether a fish being marketed is overexploited is often vague at best. If consumers thought about what they were eating, that this is wild animals, I mean, if you went into the store and there were rhinoceros steaks and some tiger chops, you'd ask a few questions. Reliable information about the origins of seafood products and the risks that can be involved with eating them is now becoming more available. Fisheries that are environment friendly are being certified according to internationally recognized standards by the Marine Stewardship Council, an independent nonprofit organization. And the products are being marketed with the MSC Eco label. Although aquaculture is not yet being certified for a consumer label, wild caught and farm raised products are being rated in seafood guides published by a variety of organizations and can be downloaded from the internet. I think it's a real grassroots movement. They're going into the store and asking, where does this product come from? Is it sustainably caught? People put more pressure on retailers. Retailers will put more pressure on the wholesalers. Wholesalers on up the line. A growing number of restaurants and chefs are also getting involved. Very important for a chef to select the right seafood and know whether it's plentiful or not. Because you establish recipe, you establish a way of cooking with that fish, you put your choice in the right place so that you can enjoy fish in the future with your children and grandchildren. As it becomes more apparent that the bounty of our oceans depends on an ecological balance millions of years in the making, a balance more fragile than ever imagined. We're learning how important it is to fish in a way that preserves the planet's most critical life support system. I think fisheries and ocean ecosystems are in much greater trouble than is commonly appreciated. If we act in the relatively near future, we can turn some of those things around. If we could get together, the regulators, the scientists, and the fishermen, I can't see why a solution can't be found. I just can't see why it can't happen. If we are to succeed in consuming aquatic creatures as a part of what we eat, we cannot rely on wild-caught populations anymore. The question is, how do we feed a population of six billion people and climbing? We've got to take the pressure off. And one of the possibilities is through responsible aquaculture. It really is very much up to us to decide. People shape the world. 
we can choose. There's a lot of potential to bring things back and have abundance and have beauty. The health of the ocean and the quality of our food is ultimately up to all of us. It depends on the everyday actions of ordinary people who care about what kind of world our children will inherit. <laughs>